2 Timothy chapter 3, reading verse 14 through 17. Bring this chapter, chapter to a close tonight. And I'm not sure, but I'm thinking about, as I said this morning, of coming back next week and spend just a little bit more time just on the, uh, the English Bible, the King James Bible. We find here beginning in verse 14 through verse 17, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this privilege to come together and fellowship together and pray together and sing the songs of Zion, and Lord, and also to look into your word. We just pray that, uh, Lord, that your blessings be on our time together. We ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The importance uh, this evening in our text is just simply placed upon the Word of God. Last week we were in verse um, 12 and 13, and we titled that the persecution of the saints. And tonight we see in our verses from verse 14 through 17 the importance of God's Word. I'm just going to title this Holy uh, Scripture. And I think from time to time, you ought to take your Bible and give it a big hug and thank God for it. Amen? And just thank Him for giving us His Word. Every time we open this book and we read it, uh, God is speaking to us. We're commanded in Scripture to pray. That's we're speaking to Him. And every time we hear His Word, we listen to His Word, we read His Word, Uh, He is speaking uh, to us. The Bible itself claims to be the Word of God. All the prophets claim the same, the Lord Jesus Himself. I gave you a handout probably uh, five or six years ago, and it just gives a long list of Jesus Christ recognizing the Scripture, believing the Old Testament. In other words, the creation story, the flood story. Uh, recognized Sodom and Gomorrah, even Lot's wife, he mentions in Luke chapter 17, and just a whole list of things that the Lord Jesus had to say about the Old Testament. One writer said, the Bible among books is what Christ is among men, and that is so true. And again, we believe that God has given us an English Bible for English-speaking people, and it's over 400 years old. It has saved millions of souls, and also it has brought revival for all of these years all over the world. Well, notice he says here in verse 14, speaking to Timothy, and of course this applies to us all, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He's encouraging Timothy, as we've read in the last number of weeks. He speaks of the persecution that uh, not only Timothy would go through, but all would go through in verse 12 and 13. And Timothy is to persevere in doctrine and also devotion. He's encouraging him throughout this book. And of course, this encouragement is to us as well. But he said, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I believe in the text he's probably referring to himself, but I think he's also referring to his parents, especially his mother and grandmother. Notice in chapter 1, chapter 1 reading in verse 5, here would be uh, his mother, his grandmother, no indication that his father was a Christian. But he said in verse 5, he said, But I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So we find that Timothy had learned from his mother and his grandmother. But also we find in verse 13 of chapter 1, 
He said, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So he learned from the Apostle Paul. He learned from his parents, which is the way it's supposed to be, and he learned from his pastor as well. You notice coming back uh, to chapter 3, verse 14 again, he said, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hath been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Then he says in verse uh, 15, in verse 15, he said, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture. This is why I included his parents in that, and also himself. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, and this is our title we've taken from tonight, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. you notice here that he calls our Bible the Holy of scripture in this passage. In other words, what we have before us tonight is sacred, it's pure, and it is undefiled. I want you to turn with me and um, hold on to your text and turn with me to the book of Romans. I want to read a few other passages. Romans chapter 1. In the book of Romans in chapter 1, and while you're turning there, I'm going to give you just a few other scripture. When the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil, and that's recorded in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. He was tempted three, on three different occasions here. And here's the importance that the Lord Jesus placed upon the Word of God. And of course, at this time, it was the Old Testament. And the first time he was tempted, it says in Matthew 4, Verse 4, it said, And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He's tempted again. And then in verse 7, And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Each time the Lord Jesus goes back to the Scripture. And really, the Bible is the only book that the Lord Jesus ever quoted from. And the third time that he was tempted, and you can read these later, but in verse uh, 10, Then said Jesus to him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then in verse 11, The devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Three temptations, and three times the Lord Jesus just goes back to the uh, Old Testament and brings the scripture forth to give to Satan. We also find, if you're taking notes, in chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, one of the Lord's first teachings. And it says in verse 17 and 18, this shows us that the Lord believed the Old Testament scripture. It said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not, shall rather in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. We see the Lord's belief in the scriptures, and he quoted the scriptures. He spoke of the scriptures where that he was prophesied in them. But also one other passage I'll give you before we read in Romans, in Matthew 24, and in verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. We have the comfort of the, the Scripture given to us. And also, where we just read in, in Timothy, and we're going to come back to this in just a moment. We find that when he says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We find that God is called holy in First Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. The Lord, the Lord Jesus is referred to as holy in Acts chapter 4 and verse 30. And we know that the Spirit, as we read this morning in certain verses, 
is called holy. It's called the Holy Spirit in First Thessalonians 1 6, and then again in Timothy, the scripture are referred to as holy. Well, notice here in Romans chapter 1, he said in verse 1 and 2, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. And then the apostle goes on in verse 3 to speak of Christ's humanity, and then in verse 4 to speak of his divinity. But I read verse 2 because it says, which he had promised afore by his prophets. Notice, in the Holy Scripture. Well, notice with me as we go back to the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to be reading in chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. I just want to take a few Old Testament passages. Proverbs chapter 30. I'm going to read just a couple of verses from this chapter. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. By the way, verse 4 speaks of God. What is His name in verse 4? The latter part of that verse. And also, what is His Son's name? So we have the Father and Son mentioned here. But notice in verse 5 and 6, and I know that most of these, if not all of them, will be very familiar to them. It was, it was good for me to go back over these and just meditate upon them a little bit to remind myself as well. But he said here in verse 5 and 6, every word of God is pure. How many believe that? Amen. Every word of God is pure, but he is a shield. Notice, let me back up. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Verse 6, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. I read this because it says that every word of God is pure. We can trust God's word. Notice in Psalms in chapter 12. Psalms chapter 12. David is writing this. He's speaking of the godly and the ungodly as you begin in verse 1. But come down with me to verse 6 and 7 for our subject here tonight. One writer says that the Word of God uh, was written by 30 to 40 authors from three different continents and three different languages over a period of about 1,600 years and not one contradiction. Written by uh, ministers and prophets and musicians and teachers and disciples and over that span and not one contradiction. Another author, he said, if it's not true, nothing matters. If it is true, nothing else matters. And then we find the statement, thus saith the Lord, or similar phrases, they're mentioned over uh, at least uh, 4,000 times in the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord, or similar phrases. So come with me to Psalms chapter 12, and I'm reading two verses. Again, it's a short uh, psalm, and it's, uh, as a matter of fact, verse 1 says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases. And we're starting to see some of this in our country as well. He said in verse 6 and 7, we're going to find here again the Word of God is perfect, it's pure, but it's also preserved. He said in verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So we have here that God has promised the preservation. We're going to see the subject of inspiration in just a moment. There's three thoughts that always come when we study that. Inspiration, revelation, and preservation. And God has... Uh, promise that he would preserve his word and we have it here in 2024 you know in the English language notice uh, also he said in chapter 11 and verse 3 if the foundation be destroyed what can the righteous do well the foundation begins with the word of God Amen. notice with me as we come to Psalms 19 Psalms 19 and I'm reading from verse 7. Again, we see the perfection, 
the purity of God's word. He said in verse 7, he said, The law of the Lord, Psalm 19, 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. A statement similar to what we've seen Paul has given to Timothy. Verse 8, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much more uh, than much fine gold, rather. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, that is the word of God, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. This is the promise we have from God's holy word. Notice with me in Psalms 138. Psalms 138. We also know that um, Psalms 119, long chapter. The whole chapter is just simply dealing with the word of God. And just two verses from that chapter, we're going to read in Psalms 138. But in Psalms 119 and verse 89, he says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Then he says in 140, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. We have the perfect, pure word of God that he has preserved for us. In Psalms 138, we read verse 1 and 2. The latter part of verse 2 is what I'm after here. He says this, he said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Now here's the, the statement I'm after. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. This again shows us the importance of God's word. I do not understand it all. I, may, I know I've even taught some things that's not been right over the years, but I have never doubted it in all the years that I've been saved or preaching. I've never doubted one word. I've had people come say, what does this mean? I said, I don't know. We'll try to figure it out. And, you know, but I've never denied any passage in the word of God. Notice as we come back to the New Testament, this time to John chapter 17. The book of John in chapter 17. Most of you probably know the verse I'm going to. This is in the night before the crucifixion. The Lord is in the upper room teaching his disciples. And uh, notice in John 17 and in verse 17, he says this, he said, sanctify, that word means to set apart, sanctify them through thy word. Notice, thy word is truth. How are we sanctified? Yes, by the Spirit and so forth, but we're sanctified by the Word of God. Not just knowing it, but it becoming a part of our life and practicing it. We also find in John 5, before we go back to our text, in John chapter 5, the, uh, again, the emphasis that is placed upon the Word of God. The Lord Jesus said this in verse 39. He said, search the Scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life. And there they would testify of me. He said, And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men. For I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. In other words, the Lord Jesus, every time he spoke, he goes back to the written word of God. He recognizes the five books of Moses. 
And he said in verse 46 and 47, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? We see the importance, again, of God's word. Go back with me. Go back with me to uh, verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. We have preached many, many sermons over the years on the Word of God. I was thinking it was a little longer since we've uh, touched this, but I think it's 2021. But just over the years, I went back and was counting some of these. I've been doing that lately. Well, how many times or when did we address these things? And I quit counting at 25. Just like I told you Wednesday night on a couple of other subjects with the tongue and some other things, I just quit counting at 25. So we've addressed this uh, from every angle that uh, I can think of. And and when uh, the King James Bible celebrated its 400th year in in 2011, right? Um, We preached a sermon every month throughout that year just on the Word of God and just showing the importance of it. Well, verse 15 again, he said that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It's the Word of God, reading the Word of God, hearing the Word of God, uh, that brings us really to saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's able to make thee wise unto salvation. Well, notice now in verse 16. He said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, I mentioned the subject of revelation, that is God giving His Word, and the Old Testament giving uh, His Word through the prophets and so forth, especially beginning with Moses. And we also have the issue of inspiration, and then, as I mentioned earlier, preservation, as in Psalms chapter 12. To me, that kind of covers all the bases when we're thinking about the Word of God. The word inspiration, as we find here in verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration. A simple definition of this just simply means God breathed. In other words, it means that God breathed, the author is the Holy Spirit, and he spake or spoke through men. To inspire means to infuse life. That's why it's called the Holy Scripture. And it reminds me of a a text, and I'll just give this to you, in Genesis 2-7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God formed his body, but there was no life until he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And that life has been transmitted from one generation to the next. And when I think about this, God formed him and breathed into him gave him physical life. Well, the scripture is God breathed. In other words, we find that the author is the Holy Spirit. We have a sermon of priests not too many years back titled The Spirit and the Word, and you can't separate them. It is the Spirit of God that gives us the Word of God. And as um, one writer put it, he said, inspiration guarantees the writer to be free from mistakes and errors, for each sentence was dictated by the Holy Spirit and each letter was penned by the finger of God. And uh, Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18, I just read a moment ago, Jesus accepted all that we refer to now as the Old Testament books as being inspired. He accepted that. Uh, turn with me to Second Peter for a moment. Notice in 2 Peter, I'm going to read here, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 21 is the verse I am after, but I want to back up and begin reading from verse 16. I want to begin reading from verse 16. 
Now notice verse 16 through 18 is referring to uh, Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ before Peter, James, and John. Verse 16 through 18, Peter writing, he said, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Now we've spent some time on that word fable or fables in our Timothy series. And we're going to run into it again as we step into 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last chapter that we'll, uh, we'll be covering. Fables are basically made up stories. So Peter is saying, uh, he says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitness of his majesty. Again, that's Matthew 17, beginning in verse 1. He said in verse 17 here, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This voice came in Matthew 3, around verse 17, when he was baptized, began his public ministry. And it was also uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says in verse 18, he says, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So Peter is saying we were eyewitnesses, verse 16, of his majesty. But he goes on to say, verse 19 through 21, that there's something else that Peter had. Peter not only was eyewitness and heard Jesus speak and saw the transfiguration, but he also had the scripture. Peter had the Old Testament scriptures at that time as well. He said in verse 19 through 21, we have also, so not only was he eyewitness, but he has the word of God. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star, that is Christ himself, and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, when we read the Scripture, it's not man's opinion. We all have opinions, but when we read the Bible, it is the word of the living God. And he said in verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. One writer put it this way in reference to verse 21. He said, men were moved, that is led, men were moved to write down God's word in their own language and their own style. And when finished, they said what God wanted said. And I believe that. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'm reading verse 23 through 25. You can trust this book. You can trust it 100%. He said in verse 23, 24, and 25, he said, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. We said this morning in John 3, we're born again by the Spirit. That's true. We're also born again by the word. He says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which notice liveth. This is a living book. It's like no other book that you can pick up out of the library. It's a living book. He says, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of God liveth and abideth forever. Now go back with me to our text, and that will be the last passage that we will 
turn to, and let's just make a few other comments here as we bring this to a close. Like I say, I've always felt like that uh, if we can convince people that this is God's Word, that they're going to have a good journey with the Lord uh, throughout their Christian life. They really believe this book. They can trust this book. Coming back to verse 16 again, he said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, it's God-breathed. He said, And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, these words that are given here, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction, that is, instruction in righteousness, I don't know where I got this. It's not original. I don't really have anything original, just to be honest with you. I heard a preacher this past week was teaching on something, and I've heard this many times, by the way. He was teaching on something, and he says, God alone gave this to me. Nobody else gave this to me. And I'm thinking, okay, you've done made a mistake. And most of us do not have many original thoughts. Most of us, what we know and we've learned, we've got it from someone else. Yes, the Holy Spirit has revealed it, but most of us have got it from someone else. I have to confess that myself. I used to be the president of a Bible camp, and I would have about 15 preachers. This was in more central Alabama. I'd have about 15 preachers, and we run it from July the 1st to July the 10th. And it was a family camp. And we'd have two or three hundred people come through the camp every summer. And I'd have about 15 preachers that would uh, come and preach for me. And we would have, um, we, I, I think I figured it up, we'd have, um, I think it was about 60 hours of preaching in 10 days. We'd have three hours in the morning, three at night. We'd have a break and uh, we'd have a breakfast and then a break in the middle of the day. And then people could uh, take a nap, or many times the men, we would be sitting around talking and discussing Scripture, and then we'd be back three hours of preaching at night, run to about 10, 10.30 at night and preaching. But one of the pastors, um, he was an elder pastor, which I are one now, or is one, and, um, and I was only in my 30s at the time, but he got up and preached, and he said, I'm going to show you something tonight that no one else knows. And I'm just automatically thinking he's going to lie to us now. That nobody else knows. And so he brought forth this particular subject. And I'm sitting there and I said, I know the book that he got it out of. A man in England that wrote this book many years ago, like in the 1800s. I said, I know the book. And I knew exactly what he was going to teach. And it was wrong. It was absolutely wrong. So what, what am I getting at here? What I'm fixing to tell you right now, I copied it from someone else. And I like this. you got four things here. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Well, the doctrine tells us what is right. And the reproof tells us what is wrong. And the correction tells us how to get right. And the instruction tells us how to stay right. That'll work, won't it? That'll work. I wrote that down several years ago, and I'm going to repeat it again. The doctrine tells us what is right. The reproof tells us what is wrong. Correction tells us how to get right. And instruction tells us how to stay right. Now, there's much more here than just that. But notice this again as we read it. He says here in verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I just have a feeling that the Bible tells us everything we need to know about life and Christianity and marriage and all these kind of things, raising children. I just feel like it's all here. We have everything that we need. Then he said this, verse 17, he said that the man of God may be perfect, fully furnished unto all good works. The man of God here, obviously, that the Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy as a minister, 
But I believe that this refers to all of us and to Christians in general. I believe this can apply to all of us. It is an allusion to the work of the prophets in the Old Testament. We see this title, the man of God. Like in 2 Kings, uh, I believe it's chapter 1 with Elijah, and 2 Kings chapter 4 with Elisha, uh, referred to as the man of God. But I believe initially this is referring to Timothy, but referring to all ministers, and I believe really can apply to, to all Christians. So he said this, he said that the man of God may be perfect. That word has the ideal, you can write down Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13, has the ideal of being mature, being prepared, being whole to be fitted. He says here that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, that is completely and fully equipped, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And we see all through the scripture the issue of good works after that were saved. Uh, just a few is in Titus chapter 2 and in verse 7 and 14. God has saved us unto good works. Ephesians 2 verse 8, 9, and 10. And then Titus 3 verses 1, verses 8, and verse 14. We can't get away from the issue of good works. We know that good works has never saved anyone, but once God has saved us, put his spirit within us, we are to bear fruit in our Christian life. But he says here in verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Truly furnished, that is fully equipped. There's two things that come to my mind as I'm going to close right here. One is living here. Got to live in different places. Uh, was raised in Tennessee. Got the pastor in Pennsylvania for three years. Got the pastor in central Alabama for five years around farmers. Most that I was around was farmers. I grew up on a farm. But coming here, um, I learned a lot about fishing, especially this man sitting right here. And um, I remember one time Brother Avery talking about planting shells and whatever. So what do you mean planting? What does all that mean? And also learned what it meant when Jesus said, cast your net, you know, on the other side. I learned how to cast the net, uh, you know, and catch mullet. And but two things come to mind when I think about this passage. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, that is fully equipped unto all good works. Shambos, when it was open down here, the growth, well, is everything, is a grocery store and everything else. The man that owned this allowed me and another man to come and preach on the streets and minister and hand out tracts. And we chose Friday to do that. We did uh, the Tuesday at the shopping center. And the reason we chose Friday, not only is it payday, not only is it a lot of people coming in, it was a major place in Bayou La Battery, was it not, Avery? They had everything. You could buy anything you wanted, in, like the general stores years ago. But on Friday, there's a lot of the sh sh fishermen and shrimpers and whatever, they were restocking their boats. The doors were just open. We hand out hundreds of tracks and witness to people every Friday. So they were, uh, they were equipping their boats so that they go, go out. Some of them go out in the bay, um, obviously some probably out into the Gulf. Also, when I was in the, in the Navy, our home port was Pensacola, the USS Lexington, and we'd be in port on the average of two weeks and sea two weeks. And so we would have to do the same thing. Have days of, um, you know, a couple of hundred men, you know, loading, passing things, you know, from one to the other and going on, on the ship so that we could go out. We'd go out usually two weeks at a time, uh, maybe a month. And so we would have to fully equip food, everything that we needed, supplies, um, parts for the machinery, everything that we worked with. We had to fully equip that once we went to sea because you couldn't get it.
uh, while he was at sea. And that comes to my mind. He tells us that in verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We have everything that we need to be a faithful servant of God here in the Holy Scripture. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we do thank you tonight again for this day. We thank you for the privilege that you've given us to assemble together. Lord, we pray your blessings now as we sing our closing hymn and take up our prayer requests. Again, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us your word. We ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.